Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Stories of real people going through their journey of life, encountering obstacles and difficulties and challenges. The people we interview here are people that have not only overcome, they've not only survived, but they've thrived. Our special guest today is Daniel Alter, originally from Beaumont, Texas, and now living in the Los Angeles area. And he's got an amazing story of the journey that he's been on the challenges that he's met and he's overcome. Daniel, it's good to have you here. Thank you. It's a We're, pleasure to meet you. We've got people from all around the world, so let's little, learn a little bit about you. Now, I was just, uh, we were visiting a little bit before, and uh, you've had a, a diagnosis, and so that the listening audience are wondering, is your speech, now that it's been affected, was it from the tumor that you had, or was it something else? Nobody has any idea. I've had the nasal speech from birth. From birth. It was exacerbated by some of the surgeries, but it was certainly not the cause of the nasal voice. Okay. Well, I wanted to get that out right at the front, so as we carry on. I, now, where are you from, first of all? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, which, if you've ever heard of it, I'm sorry. It is about 90 miles east of Houston, about 20 minutes from the Louisiana border. Okay. I've been there a couple of times, and I have to let you know, it's the most humid place I've ever been in the United States. Indeed. So you were born there, grew up, went to school there? Mm-hmm. And your family's still in that area there. Yep. They're still in the My great great grandfather, no, great grandfather, started a business there in 1915. 1915. And the family's been there ever since. Wow, 1915 it began. Now, I met, I've met your mom and dad, and I met uh, uh, your grandfather, who have, uh, since then has passed away. But if I remember right, your your father is one of three boys, mm -hmm. and all three were attorneys. Correct. And your grandfather was an attorney, Correct. and I think there may have been another uncle in there somewhere. His brother was an attorney. Was, was an attorney, yeah, all educated. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you grew up, went to a school there, mm -hmm. and then about the age of uh, 10, 11, 12, some things begin to happen. What began to happen? Well, throughout my entire life, as far back as I can remember, I got these weird headaches. If you feel the back of your head, you're going to feel two bones that make a V. Uh -huh. I would get blinding headaches right, right in there. between that V that would last from 10 to 30 seconds. Nobody knew what they were. Nobody could explain it. One doctor said, migraines, one doctor said this, one doctor said that, one doctor said I'm just making it up. Nobody knew. But beyond that, I had all kinds of other little childhood problems. I had asthma. I was clumsy. I had no depth perception whatsoever. I remember playing Little League, and they would put me in the outfield, which, <laughs> when you're in Little League, that's where they put the kids who can't play. Right. And I remember, you know, every once in a while, a ball would fly out to me, and I would run to where I knew that ball was going to fall. Only to watch it soar 30 feet over my yeah, head. You, huh? <laughs> you know, I had allergies. I had vision issues. I had this, that, and the other. And my mother, being a nervous mother with her firstborn, dragged me to every doctor on the planet. Trying to figure it out. And, of course, I had whatever that doctor specialized in. Well, it turns out that none of them were right. When I was 12 years old, during the summer, something happened. My mom said it looked like I'd had a stroke. The left side of my body 
It's kind of quit working. Almost like it was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't conscious. But I remember trying to open a jar one-handed because there was no strength in my other couldn't, arm. Couldn't use it. I was on a hike with my Boy Scout troop. On flat surface, I fell five times in three hours. And normally when you fall, you realize you're falling, you put your arms out and you catch yourself. I fell flat. Just face down. No Didn't protection. even know I was falling until I hit the ground. And after that, my dad said, okay, something's, something's wrong. So we went to the emergency room and I had a CAT scan. And the CAT scan came back clean. And thank God for the ER doctor who said, something isn't right, let's have, it, let's have an MRI. And the MRI revealed a brain tumor larger than your fist. Larger had, than a fist. Mm -hmm, that had wrapped itself around my brain stem. The doctors in Beaumont, Texas said, there's nobody here that can help you. Go to Houston. So we drove in the middle of the night to Houston, where we met with the chairman of the Pediatric Neurosurgery Board at Texas Children's Hospital, who told my parents that he was afraid to touch me, that there were maybe half a dozen surgeons in the world who would even attempt it, and to take me home and hug me. Just no, not much of a future. No. Take you home and hug you. Wow. Mm -hmm. Had to be devastating nurse. It was. Luckily, I was not in the room. My parents were alone when this happened. But yes, it was absolutely devastating. My father had some choice, not so kind words for the doctor. And we went across the street to MD Anderson. The world premier institution. Absolutely. Who, after another battery of tests, told us that they had a guy who might be able to do it. But he was out of the country for two weeks. And when he got back, if he didn't feel qualified, he would recommend me to his teacher. My dad said, thank you very much. Forget the student. We're going to the teacher. This was 1997. The internet was fairly new, but we had friends and family scouring everything they knew on what we learned was a chordoma. You find out you had a chordoma, mm -hmm. the base of your skull. Mm -hmm. The one in a few million. One in a few million, and even rarer in children. We had people scouring the internet. We had doctors combing textbooks. We even had a prominent attorney friend call the Surgeon General of the United States <laughs> to find out what to do. What well, turns out Every single document, every single paper written about Cordoma was written by the same man, Dr. Osama El Mefti. And where was he? You'll never guess, Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, man. Little Rock, Arkansas. It turns out that the Sam Walton Foundation Barbara Streisand and the j &E Trucking Company had combined efforts to build a world-class cancer hospital in, in Little Rock, Rock, Arkansas. Unbelievable. So we go home and call Dr. Elmethy's office. He, too, is out of the country at this same seminar. But his nurse 
was the first person that my mother talked to that gave us any sense of hope whatsoever. I was diagnosed, I was on the hike on a Sunday in Houston on Monday. We talked to Dr. Osama El Mefti's office on Tuesday. On Wednesday, he called and apologized for being out in the country and wanted us to come see him. Right away. It was too late for us to come off on Wednesday. So on Thursday, we have to fight to Little Rock, Arkansas, had another battery of tests, and met with the doctor at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday night. He took one look at the MRI and said, we're going in tomorrow morning. Right away. Right away. He canceled the surgery he had scheduled to put me in because the tumor had started to cut off the respiratory nerve. And there was no telling what was going to happen. What was going to happen. The first surgery was transoral. They went through my mouth. For that, they needed a surgical ENT. To tell you the power of the doctor that I had, the doctor calls the ENT and says, Bob, you're coming into surgery tomorrow. And the ENT said, Sam, I, I can't. I've got patients. I've got clinic. I've got this, that, and the other. I can't do surgery tomorrow. And my doctor said, my doctor said Bob, you're going into surgery tomorrow. <laughs> he said, okay. Now, this was Little Rock, Arkansas. This was 1997. Who was president in 1997? Who was president? Bill Clinton. From Arkansas. From Arkansas. If you remember, when Bill Clinton was campaigning, he had problems losing his voice. I didn't remember that. So he flew his personal ENT out to his speaking engagements to make sure his voice was in top tip shape. Yeah, it's the same guy. Same guy. My doctor bossed around the personal physician of the President of the United States. So you had surgery. So we go in the next morning. My parents are up all night watching. That first surgery, they had to put in a halo here and here, which I had to be conscious for, and they put in a tracheotomy. I was, that surgery lasted for 17 hours. I was out for 22. Between the time that we learned that I was going into surgery and the time that I came out, 18 friends and family members had flown or driven in from all over the country. Wow. That number 18 is important, and it's going to come up again and again, and it's pretty meaningful. So that was the first surgery. I came out. I immediately wanted something to drink, but I couldn't have anything. They were worried about spinal meningitis. Sure. A few days later, I'm doing fine. They transfer me to Arkansas Children's Hospital. Then a week later, we go in for my second surgery. The surgery was behind my right ear. Between those two surgeries, they removed 95 to 97% of the tumor. I came out of that surgery the doctor told my parents, he's doing great, we're going in tomorrow for the third surgery. The tumor, the cells itself, are actually benign. But it eats away at the surrounding tissue to make room for itself. So the doctors actually consider it cancerous. The tumor had eaten away the top vertebrae in my neck. 
so that when they removed it, there was literally not enough to keep my head on. Wow. So they had to fuse my neck, which is what they did that next day. Normally, a neck fusion takes some metal rods, some screws, and if this is your neck with your face facing this way, they drill in to fuse everything. The problem with that is that you can't put a nut on that screw. And the screws have a tendency to start Work working out. their way out. An orthopedic surgeon who was part of this group developed a new method of doing a neck fusion where you actually come in and drill from this way to be able to put in a nut. I am the 10th person in the world to Thank have you. this procedure done. <laughs> I, I knew you were special. Daniel, the time is slipping by. How did you hear about Loma Linda? Loma Linda was recommended to us by this doctor. The same doctor. The same doctor. Pro uh, chemotherapy does not work on this kind of tumor. Neither does general radiation. So proton was a viable option. So your whole family came out here. It was the only viable option. At the time, it was something that M.D. Anderson called voodoo. But we did it anyway. My entire family, I, sh I should probably mention that during all this, my mother is eight, nine months pregnant. So after we get home and after she gives birth, we pack up the suburban and drive out to Loma Linda for four months for my treatment. So this was in 1997. Correct. Now, I need to let the listening audience know that midway through your treatment, there was something you wanted to do. What was that? Yes. So if you remember, I was 12, almost 13 when diagnosed. For years, I had been studying for my bar mitzvah, the point in a Jewish person's life when they become a Jewish adult, become responsible for their own actions. My parents wanted to cancel, to postpone. Until after all this was behind you. I refused. So during surgery, during treatment, we found rabbis to continue my training. And one weekend, we flew home. Had the bar mitzvah. Had the bar mitzvah and flew back out for treatment the next day. Okay, this was in 1997. Now, let's fast forward because... Mm -hmm. You have been in school, and you've gotten a couple of degrees, and now you're studying to be a rabbi. So yes. tell us your studies. Where, where have they taken you? So my studies have taken me from Texas to Israel, back to Texas, back to Israel, and now in L.A. So now what are you doing in L.A.? In L.A., I am a graduate student at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion based in L.A. studying to become a rabbi. I am going into my fifth of six years. So you got two years left then? Two years left. Okay. So far, as part of this graduate program, I have already earned a master's in Jewish education and a master's in Hebrew letters. So you already have two graduate degrees. Correct. So this gives you all kinds of options. Absolutely. But you came under a deep conviction that you need to continue, and you're on this road now, on this journey to be a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So what does the future hold? I have no idea. I'm in school for two more years. That's that much I know. You know for sure. After that, it really depends on what the job market looks like. You know, unlike the Catholic diocese, reform rabbis have jobs like anyone else. They sign contracts with synagogues or other organizations. Other Jewish organizations. Just like any other job. Sure. So it will depend on what synagogues are looking for rabbis when they graduate. So rabbis... You'll be ordained as a rabbi mm -hmm. at the end of this, at your conclusion of the graduation. You'll become an ordained rabbi. But it gives you several different options then, Absolutely. doesn't it? Right. I could take a position as a pulpit rabbi in a synagogue. I could take a position as the education rabbi in a synagogue. I can work for a summer camp 
or a Jewish private school. I can work for Hillel, a Jewish college organization. I can work for any number of Jewish or non-Jewish nonprofits. I can work for universities as a professor. The options are endless. It sounds like it. And right now, I'm open to any and all of them. And of course, the next two years of your education, you can get another more kind of a, a direction there. But some of your, your your graduate degrees, you were telling me you took some Hebrew, apparently. Mm -hmm. How much Hebrew have you taken? I have taken a total of two and a half years of Hebrew. It sounded like you had one accelerator program. In order to, for entry into this program. Into the rabbi program? Into the, into the rabbinic program. You were expected to pass a test of fourth semester college Hebrew fluency. Four semesters is usually two years. But when I knew that this is what I wanted to do, I signed up for an accelerated program offered by the University of Texas that got me all four semesters in one year. <laughs> So and you, I took that test halfway through the second semester. And you passed it. I did. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, God has given you some gifts at, at mm -hmm. language. That's wonderful. So now, what kind of work are you doing? Uh, you told me briefly that you're assigned to one of the synagogues here in the area. And so every year it kind of changes. You know, this past year I worked as a student rabbi on a military base out in the middle of nowhere, California. I know where you're talking about. China Lake, California. It's right next to nothing. Indeed. Right. And they have had student rabbis from Hebrew Union College for over 50 years. So I'm part of a really proud tradition. This summer, I am working with a rabbi who is opening up a branch of the Religious Action Center a social action and social justice based organization that had previously been based in DC. We are opening up a branch in LA. Really? Mm -hmm. And this coming year, I will be serving as the student rabbi at Temple Beth El in San Pedro, California. Well, it'll be a little easier for traveling back and forth. Then. Indeed. Well, yeah. So now, when you're going out to China Lake, are you are you preaching? Or are you? I'm doing all kinds of things. Doing, uh, I, are you the rabbi for that area? I, I was for well, this past year. Yeah. Okay. Like, is that like an intern? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would go out one weekend a month. I would lead Friday night services. I would lead Saturday morning services. I would teach two different religious school classes. I would teach an adult ed course. I would work with a conversion student, visit anyone else that needed. I actually worked with a Presbyterian church mm -hmm. out there as well, who were doing a world religion course and wanted to know more about Judaism. Well, I remember meeting you about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I lost track for a few years, and, and I need to let you know, Danny, I've been absolutely amazed at the, well, at the path that God has had you on, how you blossomed into a young man, and how God has been blessing you with some unusual gifts thank in you. your studies. And I don't know what the future holds, but I can tell you I know who holds the future. And God's got some wonderful plans for you. You're an inspiration for our listening audience. There are people here that have encountered some kind of challenge, but yours has been an unreal one. And you're one of those people that are not only a survivor, but you're a thriver. What would you tell? Look into the, into the uh, uh, camera here. And if somebody was diagnosed with something today, what would you tell them? You are not your disease. So many people hear a diagnosis and instantly label themselves as what that is. I'm a cancer patient. I'm this, I'm that. No, you're not, you're you. You've got to deal with some unfortunate things and for that I'm sorry. And it can be really rough. But remember who you are. 
in Judaism, we teach about two different kinds of healing. There's healing and curing. Curing is the body. Right. It's getting rid of the virus, getting rid of the cancer. Healing is of the mind and of the spirit. And these two are independent. Some people can be cured, exactly right. but never healed. And some people are healed, but never cured. You are not your disease. And no matter what, remember that. Remember who you are. You are bigger than whatever it is you're facing. That's wonderful counsel. And that's really kind of an undergirding philosophy here at Loma Linda, to make man whole, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We're a totality of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Not one part here and one part here, but the totality. And, and Dan, you're an excellent example of what God can do with and through and to a person. And, and not only is he taking you through this, but now you're going to be a blessing to others. And for our listening audience, you know, Daniel is a wonderful example of someone who's been countered all kinds of difficult challenges. And yet God has taken them through. And the counsel he's given you, you are not the disease. You are you. And you need to remain you. But as you look to God... Allow him to open and close doors because he's got a wonderful plan. Daniel, I'm confident that God's got some wonderful plans. I'm going to be anxious to follow you and to see how you develop. And I'm glad that you're going to be here in this area for at least the next couple of years. Absolutely. I know God's going to continue to open and close doors. We're proud of you. I know your family's proud of you. And I know that God is proud of you. For our listening audience, those who are looking on, give God a chance with your life. Each day, the psalmist says, today is the day of the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Look to him. He's waiting for you just now.